Great. Welcome, everyone. Can everybody hear me? I don't know. Erin, can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, well, welcome, everybody, um, to this inaugural ILD Day. Uh, on behalf of myself and the organizers and Dr. Wilfong, we're really uh, pleased to have you join us. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, myself and Dr. Wilfong will be our speakers today. We'll be um, providing a broad overview in two different sections. I'll give a general overview of interstitial lung disease, and then Dr. Wilfong uh, from Vanderbilt will then talk about some specific immune mediated causes of interstitial lung disease. Next slide. Uh, before I get into my talk, I want to note that um, you can submit questions via the questions box on the webinar dashboard. Um, it is important to note that we can't answer specific questions about your care, but we're happy to address more general questions that can be applicable to the broader audience. Um, you can also download the slides from the handouts section on the dashboard. And then um, as a disclaimer, please note that any information contained in this presentation is for informational and or educational purposes only. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice and always consult your personal physician or healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding your specific condition. All right, so we're just going to get started here. Next slide, please. Here are my personal disclosures. Next slide, please. So, you know, in talking about interstitial lung disease, it, it can be, become very complicated very fast. And, and part of the reason for that is we use a lot of weird terms, terms that actually don't match the disease. And so it can get very confusing for patients and their um, partners in trying to understand and make sense of, of these conditions. So hopefully a part of this talk will kind of demystify some of these terms that we use and you know, provide a general foundation for understanding um, diseases moving forward. Next slide, please. So in my first part of the talk, we'll talk about what interstitial lung disease is, uh, what we know about interstitial lung disease as a group of conditions, and then how uh, patients get diagnosed with having ILD. Next slide. Next slide. So we're just gonna start with some simple lung anatomy. You can see some pretty rudimentary cartoons here um, about the lung. So the lung here on the left, um, I, when I'm talking to patients about interstitial lung disease, I like to describe the lungs like an upside down tree. So you have your main tree trunk and the tree trunk then branches into multiple small branches and the branches get smaller and smaller until they get into the leafy portion of the tree. Next slide, please. And the lung, the leafy portion of the tree, are referred to as alveoli. They're tiny little grape sacs in the lung that really do the hard work of the lungs to transfer oxygen from um, out here and then put it into the bloodstream. Next slide, please. And so when you take a close-up picture of normal lung tissue, this is um, a specimen of human lung tissue that you can see um, uh, here and all the little delicate grape sacs are, are depicted as those thin pink lines. And you can see the cartoon on the right are to reflect those little grape sacs. And so air comes into the lungs and goes into all the way down the branches of the tree and into the, um, to the grape sacs of the lung. And um, across the thin interstitium, oxygen will transfer from inside the lungs and into the bloodstream. Next slide, please. What you can see um, is a slide that's representative of what happens in patients who have interstitial lung disease. You can see a lot of those thin little pink lines have been replaced by um, scar tissue and sometimes inflammatory cells. And um, again, you can look again at the cartoon on the right hand side. So those thin little um, interstitial lines are replaced by scar tissue represented by the little um, yellow uh, X's or inflammatory cells in the little blue uh, dots. And all forms of interstitial lung disease have varying amounts of inflammation and fibrosis that contribute to the symptoms that patients experience. Next slide, please. 
And so when we have this process occur in the interstitium and in the alveoli of the lungs, the consequences are that oxygen can't move from the air to the blood. And so here we're using a lot of, oh, using a lot of different cartoons to show um, what this means. And so here on the um, first part is those with normal lungs. So you can see the thin little black line is meant to represent the interstitium and air goes easily, or oxygen, I should say, goes easily across this thin little um, uh, membrane. But those with interstitial lung disease, that membrane becomes thick, either from scar tissue or inflammatory cells. And so oxygen has a tough time crossing over that thickened interstitium. Next slide. So here is another cartoon to show what happens um, when um, the lungs are affected by interstitial lung disease. In a normal alveolus, you have a very thin, um, thin membrane, and so when you take in a big deep breath in, it allows oxygen to enter um, the lungs very easily and the expansion is very easy. In patients who have interstitial lung disease, that thickened um, interstitium um, leads to poor lung expansion and it makes it more difficult for oxygen to enter. Next slide, please. So now we're gonna transition to talk about what we know about different forms of interstitial lung disease. Next slide. So interstitial lung disease should be thought of as an umbrella category term. It's not a specific disease, but it encompasses um, more than 100 different conditions. And uh, we've classically uh, lumped these conditions into kind of buckets of disease. And so I've listed some representative examples here. So those with a known cause of interstitial lung disease, here we're gonna hear more later today about autoimmune related causes of interstitial lung disease. But of course, there are others that we include in this known category, including environmental exposures. We refer to this group of conditions as hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Certain medications or chest radiation is known to cause interstitial lung disease. And of course, certain occupations are associated with the development of interstitial lung disease. The second main category is this group of unknown causes, um, although we're actually learning a lot more about these conditions now um, than we did in the past. But there are eight conditions here, the most common of which I've listed here, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and then idiopathic nonspecific interstitial pneumonia. The third category is considered granulomatous um, type of interstitial lung disease, and we'll hear a little bit about sarcoidosis again later in the talk. And then finally, the last category is basically um, a miscellaneous uh, category where it doesn't fit nicely into our other little categories here. Um, it includes diseases like LAM or lymphangioleomyomatosis, Langerhans cell histiocytosis, and chronic eosinophilic pneumonia as some examples, but there's multiple conditions that fall into this category. Next slide, please. So other facts about ILD, um, pulmonary fibrosis is seen in a subset of patients with interstitial lung disease. So as um, some of the cartoons showed earlier is that interstitial lung disease really represents varying amounts of inflammation and scar tissue. And pulmonary fibrosis really specifically refers to the scarring of the lung tissues and IPF being one of the more common forms of interstitial lung disease and pulmonary fibrosis. The thing that um, has us worried, of course, um, is that the number of patients with ILD is increasing over time. Um, there are estimates that more than 250,000 Americans are living with pulmonary fibrosis and interstitial lung disease, and we're diagnosing 50,000 new cases each year. And the reason that this is, um, uh, a problem, not only just because of awareness related to the disease, this diagnosis can be challenging. Some of the initial symptoms um, in patients who have interstitial lung disease are not very specific for ILD and can um, be seen in other forms that are far more common, like asthma or COPD. And um, diagnosis really takes um, a significant effort that we'll go through in the next several slides. Next slide. So now I'm gonna end with um, describing to you some of the tools um, that we use to diagnose patients with interstitial lung disease. Next slide. 
So we use a combination of history and other diagnostic tools to help us come to um, which ILD subtype patients have. And we'll go through each of these uh, separately. Next slide, please. We're gonna start with the history. So the medical history of the patient is incredibly important, um, not only in terms of um, history related to cancer and certain medications that you might be exposed to, but also autoimmune related conditions. A prior diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis or scleroderma, for example, are really important um, historical um, or medical history elements that your doctor will need to know about you. Next slide, please. Medications are also really important to tell your doctor about, not only about the current medications that you're currently taking, but any medications you might have taken in the past for heart disease or for cancer or for other um, things like urinary tract infections. As we know, some medications are associated with lung toxicity that may not present um, right away and may reflect uh, prior damage from um, certain medications. In addition, any over-the-counter medications or herbal supplements that you might be using are really good things to share with your uh, physician as they might be related as well. Next slide, please. Family history is also becoming um, increasingly important in terms of whether or not you have any family members that have been diagnosed with similar conditions, whether it's pulmonary fibrosis or interstitial lung disease, or other autoimmune conditions like rheumatoid arthritis or scleroderma. A lot of work is being done here to better understand the genetics and the heritability of some of these conditions. And certainly um, uh, some patients who have pulmonary fibrosis have a strong genetic predisposition for this disease. Next slide, please. The environmental history is also one that um, leads to occasional chuckles in the clinic, but also very critical in the evaluation of patients who are suspected to have interstitial lung disease. Um, the environment, um, you know, the lungs are in constant communication with the environment and certain things that we inhale into our lungs um, for a specific subset of the population can lead to inflammation and subsequent scar formation. And so we'll be asking patients about exposure to birds or bird feathers or exposures to mold, um, you know, whether it's uh, moldy hay in the barn or whether it's, um, you know, mold in the bathroom or other locations that might harbor things that you could be inhaling into the lungs and could be associated with your lung disease. Next slide, please. And finally, we'll ask you about hobbies and occupational history. Um, we certainly know that certain occupations, you know, coal miners being a great example of this, but coal workers' lung, we know that coal miners are at risk for having interstitial lung disease related to their occupation. And so other things that we might ask you about are um, construction work, welding, um, sandblasting, uh, working in the mines or having asbestos or beryllium exposure. These are all things that could be relevant to your disease. Next slide, please. So then we will use that medical history and apply specific tools to help come to a diagnosis of interstitial lung disease. Next slide, please. The first thing, of course, is signs and symptoms related to interstitial lung disease. The spectrum of symptoms is actually quite broad. Some patients are asymptomatic. We find disease through other means, through screening, cardiac CT scans, or other reasons, so they may not have symptoms. Other patients will report a chronic cough or a cold that won't go away, a shortness of breath, particularly with activity, fatigue is a common symptom, and then decreased exercise tolerance. When you're in the clinic, the things that we'll be looking for include low oxygen saturation at rest or with activity, uh, crackles on examination, so the, uh, the sound of, of Velcro being pulled apart when we listen to your lungs. And then finally, some patients will have a change to the shape of their fingernail bed, um, referred to as clubbing, and we'll look for that, in addition to other things that could be contributing to your lung disease, like signs of rheumatoid arthritis or scleroderma. Next slide, please. In terms of the lung function, um, every patient who's suspected to have interstitial lung disease will get pulmonary function testing as part of their evaluation. Patients who have interstitial lung disease tend to have a decreased forced vital capacity, how much air you can blow out of your lungs. 
They'll also have evidence of a decreased diffusing capacity for carbon monoxide. It's kind of a representative value that tells us how well your lungs take oxygen um, from out here and then put it into the bloodstream. Um, and usually we define these conditions, generally speaking, as a restrictive lung process where the lungs are smaller um, than they should be. Next slide. Uh, one of the most critical um, tools that we use to assess patients who are suspected or who have interstitial lung disease is the high-resolution CT scan. So this is basically um, an imaging modality that takes very thin slices of your chest and for, of your lungs. And um, as I said already, it's one of the most important tools that we have in evaluating patients who are suspected to have interstitial lung disease. And here the protocol is important. Not all CT scans are the same, and we really do want high quality images um, done using certain maneuvers so that we can get the most information using this non-invasive test as possible. Next slide, please. So here you can see some images that we can get from a high resolution CT scan. The um, image on the left is that of a normal lung, and the image on the right is that of somebody affected by pulmonary fibrosis. Next slide, please. Other tests for diagnosis, um, these are not routinely obtained on all individuals. It really is on a case-by-case -case basis uh, whether or not these tests are obtained. Uh, blood tests can include autoimmune blood tests or genetic tests, bronchoscopy, which is a procedure um, where they take a camera into the lungs that might be done to look for signs of inflammation or infection. And in a few patients, a surgical lung biopsy may be required to determine the underlying type of interstitial lung disease, uh, but is not recommended for all. Next slide. So with all of that information, it's really important to recognize that the diagnosis and management of interstitial lung disease really takes a village um, between pulmonologists, rheumatologists, radiologists, surgeons, and pathologists coming together to integrate the clinical history, the lung function, the CT findings, and other tests that might be indicated in the evaluation um, really need to come together in order to come up with a diagnosis. And then once a diagnosis is obtained, it's working with um, several essential people, including nurses, pharmacists, social workers, rehab, and other specialists to really provide multidimensional and multidisciplinary approach to care. And with that, um, I'm going to end my part of um, the webinar, and I'll hand it over to Dr. Wolfong. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. So I'm going to spend the next little bit chatting about immune-mediated lung disease and um, particularly focusing on connective tissue disease and sarcoidosis, but realizing that I'm not going to talk about every single disease that is immune-mediated and causes lung disease. I'm just going to hit on some of the highlights. Next slide, please. These are my disclosures. I'll give everyone just a split second to look at those. Next slide. So, you know, in medicine, we talk a lot about being a lumper or a splitter. Are we somebody who, when we think about a problem, we kind of put things together, or do we like to keep everything separate? And for interstitial lung disease, I typically think of these as different buckets. And so, like Dr. Lee talked about, we have the idiopathic fibrosis bucket, and we have the hypersensitivity pneumonitis bucket, which is usually environmental causes and those things. And then we have connective tissue disease, um, which has a whole bunch of different diseases that are within the rheumatic disease or connective tissue disease category, or sarcoidosis. Next slide. And these are really, the last two are the immune-mediated lung diseases that we're going to go ahead and focus on today. Next slide. So why does this matter? Why am I going to be spending you know, the next 15 to 20 minutes talking about immune-mediated lung disease? And next slide. The reason this matters is that if it's an immune-mediated disease, this can actually respond to immunosuppression. And I'm showing you here three figures from various papers that have been published on three of the major uh, causes of immune-mediated lung disease, namely sarcoidosis, systemic sclerosis or scleroderma, and myositis. And what you can see is that the way that these graphs are all plotted is that you have some change in your FEC, your vital capacity, how big of a breath can you take on the vertical axis, 
and then across the horizontal axis is time. And what you can see is that as you go through time, as you move further to the right on each of these graphs, the lines are tilted up. And that's because as you're treating with various forms of immunosuppression or immune medications, you can actually improve lung disease. Now that's obviously the goal, and unfortunately not every patient will get better with immunosuppression. That's our hope, but some people will not respond to immunosuppression and their disease can get worse over time. And some patients, I tell a lot of my patients, our goal is just to stabilize your lung disease. So as we move on, probably a lot of folks haven't thought about immunology since their high school or college classes. And so I wanna spend a few minutes really talking about why the immune system matters and parts of the immune system, because as you're talking with your doctor about different management options and different medications that can be used, a lot of that depends on how we're targeting the immune system. And connective tissue diseases and sarcoidosis, as I've said, are due to immune dysregulation. And the treatments that we use modulate the immune system. And depending on a specific disease process, depending on how a disease has a dysregulated immune system will depend on which treatments we use. As many of you guys have noticed on TV, you'll hear, you know, this medication is for rheumatoid arthritis, this medication is for your psoriasis. And even though psoriasis usually doesn't cause lung disease, it still matters what you have when we're choosing your medications. Next slide. So, when we think about the immune system, again, I kind of lump things together. There's two big groups. So on the left here, we have our innate immunity. So this is the very primitive immune system that has kind of generic responses. And the neutrophils are what we think of as our kind of our, our main calorie. So they are going to be eating up bacteria and fungus. They clean up, you know, when we cut ourselves on our skin, they manage the infections locally but they aren't smart. They don't necessarily recognize a certain thing. They just see something bad and attack it and try to clean that up. Macrophages are very important for sarcoidosis and they can actually detect and wall off bacteria and other harmful microbes to keep them contained, to keep them from spreading to the rest of the body. But again, this is a generic response to a stimulus. It's not something that the body has learned over time. I want to contrast that with humoral immunity or learned immunity. And this is what's more important for our autoimmune diseases. And there are two big cell types that are involved in humoral immunity, namely your B cells and your T cells. And the way B cells work is B cells make antibodies. They make proteins that recognize a specific protein or a sugar or something on a virus or a bacteria or a microbe that then can it bind onto that microbe and help the rest of your body realize that it has a problem, look, there's something here that shouldn't be, and eliminate that pathogen from the body. But again, the B cell itself does not fight the infection. It makes proteins that help fight the infection. T cells, on the other hand, are cells that learn classically to recognize a virus and kill virus-infected cells. And their other main role is to help B cells be smarter in the antibodies that they make. And so these two cells work very closely together to help our body learn over the course of our lifetimes how to recognize infection. And so when you're little, you have to learn how to you know, deal with lots of different infections. But this is why there's the classical teaching that when we get a vaccine, our body learns how to fight that virus. And then going forward, we know how to do that, our body knows how to recognize it, and it's less of a threat. Next slide. And so what I'm gonna talk about, you know, a little bit over the next few slides are macrophages and their close cousin dendritic cells, B and T cells, and various immune responses. Next slide. So this is something that is a little bit off topic, but I think worth talking about. And the best way to think about how the innate and adaptive immune systems work together is vaccine responses. And this is something obviously that's been very big in the news over the past year. How does your immune system actually work for an infection and a vaccine? So with a vaccine, and this is a classical flu vaccine or something like that, we actually inject killed particles of the flu. 
into your body and these get recognized by the dendritic cells and the macrophages that say, you know, these shouldn't be here. This isn't me. And it then carries those particles to a lymph node. And this is why after a vaccine, sometimes you can feel some swelling of your glands in your neck or under your armpit. And this is where our B cells and our T cells hang out. And in the lymph node, these dendritic cells and these macrophages can say, hey, look what I found. Do you want to learn how to kill X, Y, or Z? And in the case of a vaccine, yes, we want to learn how to do that. And so the T cell is able to interact with the B cells, which are able to interact with these various cells to form antibody producing B cells or plasma cells. And the T cells develop to actually be able to recognize that this virus has infected a cell and kill that cell directly. And so this is the goal, right? We want our body to be able to recognize microbes, recognize vaccines and develop protective responses. Next slide. The challenge is sometimes this can go a little bit sideways. And so in autoimmune disease, all of our B cells and our T cells are supposed to have grown up to be smart and to realize that we attack viruses and bacteria and we learn how to deal with vaccines, but we don't attack ourselves. Sometimes though, for reasons that we don't fully understand, the immune system can get confused. And sometimes this starts by what we call molecular mimicry, where the body tries to recognize a virus or tries to recognize a bacteria, and it gets confused. And the antibody that it makes to try to attack that bacteria or virus actually cross-reacts with our cells. And so now we're producing antibodies, or we've trained T cells, not just to attack a virus, but these can actually attack us. And that's one way that autoimmune disease can form. And forgive me for the construction outside of my office if you're hearing any pounding right now. Um, and so what you can end up with is you a learned response of your immune system that can lead to tissue damage uh, and, and damage to your lungs or your kidneys or your joints or other places. Next slide. So how do we treat immune-mediated lung disease? So what I tell my patients is if the immune system can't play nice, then we need to put it in timeout and suppress it with medications. And we target the cells and we target our medications based on the disease or the cytokines or the immune dysregulation of the disease that we're trying to target. And that's why Dr. Lee was talking about it's so important to think about what is the disease we're treating? What is the driver of this? so that we know which pills or injections we should be using to treat your specific lung disease and the disease that's, under, that's underlying that uh, immune process. Next slide. And so I wanna spend the next few minutes talking about symptoms that are associated with sarcoid and other common systemic rheumatic diseases or connective tissue diseases that some of you may be experiencing and have been diagnosed and some people may have have and not really realized that's something that they should point out to their doctor. So next slide. So we'll talk first about sarcoidosis. And we don't really know what causes sarcoidosis. We know that it's more common in African and Scandinavian and in European descent. And it's more common in women. And it's more common in people ages 30 and 50. But it can happen in anyone. And common symptoms that you're going to have your doctor talk to you about are things like shortness of breath. The lungs are very commonly affected, but what's important to realize is that lots of people with, who have sarcoid in their lung can be treated with medications or in some cases actually not require any treatment and it'll go away on its own. Also, your doctor is going to look for skin nodules, especially in front of your shins. If you have these sore purple or red nodules on your shins, that's called erythema nodosum, is a very common cause, um, common symptom of sarcoidosis. You may have red or painful eyes. And when we talk about sensitivity to light, this is sensitivity to a candlelight. It's not the fluorescent light in your office or the sun. You literally just want to sit in a dark room with a blanket over the television and maybe a candle in the other room because anything else is too painful. And so these are symptoms of sarcoidosis that can occur with the lung disease. And so your doctor will ask about these um, as well. Next slide. Another big disease that we see causing a lot of lung disease is systemic sclerosis or scleroderma. 
And even though we're talking about the lung, and these names mean, you know, thickening of the skin, actually your whole body is involved. And so the skin thickening occurs, especially on the hands or the face, but can be more diffuse. And your doctor will look for little red spots on your cheeks, as you can see here on the top left. And you can develop calcium deposits that can be quite painful on your fingers. The GI tract is very commonly involved. So things like heartburn, constipation, diarrhea, difficulty swallowing, are all GI manifestations of scleroderma. So if you're presenting with lung disease, this is why your doctor may talk to you about difficulty swallowing or new heartburn that's just come up in the past couple of years has been problematic. Commonly, patients will have Raynaud's phenomenon. And when we talk about Raynaud's, we're really talking about fingers turning colors and not just red, but very blue, white. It's classically, there'll be first they'll turn white and then they'll turn blue and then they'll turn red. So we talk about triphasic changes, and your doctor will also talk to you about joint pain and contractions. And all of these are symptoms of scleroderma. Next slide. Another very common autoimmune disease that's actually very under-recognized as a cause of pulmonary fibrosis and interstitial lung disease is inflammatory myositis. And like Dr. Lee talked about, some of our naming's not that good. Myositis means muscle inflammation. And so you would think that you've got to have muscle involvement to have inflammatory myositis, and that's actually not true. We know that a lot of patients with myositis spectrum disease will not have any muscle involvement at all. They may have some subtle skin findings, but their main feature can be lung disease. And so the things that we talk about and look for for things that support a myositis um, type picture are heliotrope rashes, especially over the eyelids. And so I have several women who told me that they've quit wearing eyeshadow because a year before they saw me, their eyes developed this very pretty purple color on their own, and they have their nice natural violet eyeshadow now. It's actually a rash from their muscle, uh, from their myositis. We look for rashes over the knuckles. On the bottom right, we look for cracking on the sides of the fingers or splitting or bleeding. And this can be a sign of mechanics hands. We will talk, of course, about muscle weakness, and we're worried about proximal muscle weakness. So our shoulders, our biceps, difficulty getting off of the toilet due to hip and quadricep weakness. We don't worry as much about hand weakness as a cause of myositis. And so all of these things together would give your doctor a clue that we need to think about myositis as a cause of your lung disease. Next slide. But probably the most common cause of uh, connective tissue disease, lung disease, is rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is the most common form of connective tissue disease overall and can affect, depending on the population, 1% to 2% of individuals. And about somewhere, depending on the study and how we define it, 5 to 20% of patients with RA will have some degree of lung disease. So it's really important to realize a lot of those aren't significant. It's maybe a little bit of scarring in your lungs on a CT scan, but your pulmonary function test can be preserved. You can have no symptoms. You may not need directed therapy for your lungs, but if somebody looked hard enough, they could find a little bit of something to say that it's there. And rheumatoid arthritis is classically going to involve the joints, and it's classically going to be your small joints, so your hands, your wrists, your feet, um, your and the way to tell this apart from like an osteoarthritis is that rheumatoid arthritis gets better when you move. So your joints feel are worse in the morning. It takes a couple of hours when you're untreated for your joints to loosen up all the way. And then people want to keep moving all day because as soon as they sit down, they'll start, we call it gelling. Those joints will start stiffening back up and causing them more pain. Whereas osteoarthritis, you may have some pain in the morning, and then you do okay, but it gets worse if you use your joints. So for I have patients whose osteoarthritis will get worse if they try to knit or they try to type or their knee osteoarthritis gets worse if they're walking around. Whereas a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, their knees may feel better the more they walk. And I've known patients to start walking two to three miles to work to kind of loosen up in the morning before they make it into the office. Next slide. Another common cause is Sjogren's syndrome. And Sjogren's syndrome actually is pretty uncommon to involve the lungs, although Sjogren's itself is fairly common. The vast majority of patients with Sjogren's syndrome will just have dry eyes or dry mouth. And so it's important to realize that even if you have Sjogren's, it's unlikely to actually cause a lot of lung disease. And so it's something that your doctor may screen you for. 
But it's not something that if you have Sjogren's, you need to be terrified that you're going to have progressive pulmonary fibrosis because that really occurs in the very minority of patients. Next slide. And so as Dr. Lee talked about, how do these diseases get diagnosed? Next slide. So for sarcoidosis, a lot of times you do want a biopsy. You want to see these granulomas. You want to see the abnormal granulomatous inflammation. And the skin and the lungs are the most common places that are biopsy. For connective tissue disease, we do some skin biopsies, but blood work can be very, very, very helpful. And so for my patients that I'm screening for connective tissue disease, I send off a lot of blood work and it takes weeks to months to come back for some of the labs. So, you know, I sent some blood work out on a patient yesterday and I told them we're not going to get these lab results for six to 12 weeks, but it's useful when it comes back. And in the meantime, I'm using other clues to figure out what's going on. The other thing to know is that blood work is imperfect. And so lots of people can have a positive screening test for an autoimmune antibody, like a rheumatoid factor or an anti-nuclear antibody, that doesn't necessarily mean you have a connective tissue disease. Those things become more common as all of us get older. And so what may be a really good screening test in a 20-year-old may not be so good in a 60, 70, 80-year-old who's being recognized to have lung disease. And so this is why it's so important that if you have one of these tests, that a rheumatologist be involved in performing a history and a detailed physical exam to help tease out which of these tests are real, which of these tests aren't real, which is a non-specific thing that we don't need to worry about, and where do we really need to say, no, I know you don't have a lot of other symptoms, but based on this antibody, based on what I'm seeing on your history and exam, I think this is an immune-mediated lung disease. And these are all things that specially trained pulmonologists who see a lot of this and rheumatologists are used to seeing. Rheumatologists, we love our x-rays. So if you come to a rheumatologist, don't be surprised if we want x-rays of your hands and your feet, especially. Sometimes we will get x-rays as well of the back and spine, looking for more uncommon causes of lung disease that we can see easily through the spine. And the reason for that is we don't like to biopsy people's lungs or internal organs if we can avoid it. It's way safer to talk and get some blood work done and maybe some more x-rays of you know, a spine or hands or feet than just recommend that somebody go ahead and go through with a surgical lung biopsy. So a lot of times at Vanderbilt, especially young folks, we really advocate that they undergo an extensive workup for autoimmune disease. And a lot of times I'll see them, even if there's very low suspicion, just to make sure that we can, that the biopsy is needed and there's not another way to avoid sending someone to a procedure. Uh, next slide, please. And then the most common question that I get of all of my patients is, what's my prognosis? Am I gonna be okay? If I have a connective tissue disease or I have sarcoid, what does this mean for me? Next slide. The prognosis varies by exact disease. So like I said with sarcoidosis, there's, and we didn't go into this in detail, there's four stages of sarcoidosis. And some people with just the lung inflammation, it resolves spontaneously. And the vast majority of cases, it never progresses to true progressive pulmonary fibrosis and interstitial lung disease. For patients with scleroderma, we know that some of them do tend to progress. And so it's important that we recognize that they have ILD. And if there's any signs of progression at all, that we be aggressive starting them on medication. Same with myositis. And so it really depends on your disease and how you're behaving and what your imaging and your testing is looking like to really help with the prognosis. But what we do know is that early diagnosis and initiation of appropriate treatments or immune suppressant medications in most patients, cases really do help patients. And patients can do quite well with these diseases and stay stable for many years or even decades. But sometimes it takes time to find the right medication and find the right management approach. And so I tell my patients, don't be discouraged if you don't respond to the first medication. I have plans B, C, D, and E that sometimes we have to work our way through. And even though A may not work, maybe C is gonna work really well for you. And so I always tell patients that it can sometimes take us time to find the right medication. The important thing to realize though, is that immunosuppressants cannot re can reverse inflammation and can improve lung function. But if there's a lot of scarring, that's not something my immunosuppressants can fix.
And so this is why we really want to promote early diagnosis and recognition and getting on medications early, because if the lungs have already been extensively scarred and there's tons of honeycombing and the damage is fibrotic and irreversible, that's not something I'm going to fix. And in those situations, I'll sometimes tell patients, you know, I think we're better off looking at lung transplant and not doing a lot of immunosuppression right now, because I think you're a great lung transplant candidate, and I don't think my medications are going to benefit you. But that's, we want to obviously keep people in their own lungs for as long as possible, and so that's always a balancing act that I talk about with my patients. And so again, like Dr. Lee said, these are complicated issues, and so while I've given some general overview today of how I think about immune-mediated lung disease and some of the medications that we may use, I think it's really important to talk to your doctor, and especially if you have concerns that you have any of the symptoms we talked about today, talk to your doctor about that um, to get those evaluated, but each person is different, and so the management decisions have to be a little bit tailored to each person. Next slide. And with that, I think Dr. Lee and I are ready to take some questions. Great. Um, thanks, uh, Dr. Wolfong. That was really a uh, nice overview. So I'm going to, uh, we have the questions coming in. So remember, you can put them in the little question box um, on the on the panel and, um, and we'll just try and tackle as many of these as we can. Um, I'm going to ask Dr. Wolfong the first question, which is, could all types of arthritis be associated with pulmonary fibrosis in some way? Yeah, so I think this is a really common question that I get. So a big distinction, and I tried to make this a little bit during my talk, is osteoarthritis, which is kind of the degenerative form of arthritis that every one of us is going to get to some degree if we're not 20 anymore. Um, that's not really associated with lung disease. And certain autoimmune diseases are much more commonly associated with lung disease than others. So things like psoriatic arthritis, if I ask one of my rheumatology mentors at UCSF, does psoriatic arthritis cause lung disease? She will tell me no every time and to stop asking her about that. Can you find one case report in the literature? Sure. And do I have a patient who has psoriatic arthritis and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis? Yes, because as one of my other mentors said, dogs can have ticks and fleas. So sometimes you're a little bit unlucky and can have two things. But there are certain autoimmune diseases that really tend to like to go to the lungs. And those are the ones that we look at and look out for the most. And I'm not sure if that answered your question, Dr. Lee. Yes, I think that was great. Uh, response. Um, the second question um, is one asking about um, ILD and genetics and whether or not there's research going on in that. And, and the answer is yes, there is actually a lot of research going on um, in interstitial lung disease, in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and autoimmune related interstitial lung diseases, including rheumatoid arthritis and scleroderma, trying to determine whether or not there is genetic predisposition, either um, not only in families that might have um, multiple cases of RA or multiple cases of pulmonary fibrosis, but even in those patients who don't have any family history of disease, because we, we are understanding that genetics is becoming increasingly important. How we apply the genetics, I think, is a whole other can of worms, and we're not quite ready for that, but certainly a lot of research being done on that. And um, if anybody is interested in participating um, in research, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to the PFF and or your other organizations. They'll have um, links to be able to um, direct you to the right folks. And... Um, with that, I will go on to the next question, which is, does having a diagnosis of sarcoidosis automatically mean you have interstitial lung disease? So I would say no, and I'll be interested to throw this one back to Dr. Lee and get her take on this too as a pulmonologist. So like we talked about, to me, interstitial lung disease when I think about it, is a little bit more chronic. And so I, when I think of a young person, we call it Loeffler syndrome, who has, you know, by sarcoidosis and has some lymph nodes in their chest and has ankle arthritis and some spots on their knees, on their shins. Do they have sarcoidosis? Yes. Do they have lung involvement? Maybe. Do they have ILD? Probably not. They're going to be fine in six months. And so I think that there, some patients with sarcoidosis definitely go on to progress to interstitial lung disease in a more chronic um, 
pulmonary fibrosis type pattern, but I think some patients with sarcoidosis definitely can spontaneously resolve, and I would not classify them as a true ILD patient. I agree. I mean, I, I definitely think that um, when we're talking about ILD, we think that there's, you know, more chronic or long-term consequences as a result of the involvement related to the lung, and um, and um, and certainly agree that not everybody with sarcoid has clinically significant interstitial lung disease. Okay, great. So um, the next question, we're getting so many questions and we'll try to <laughs> address as many as possible. So um, uh, we'll, we'll just keep going here. Uh, can bibasal or atelectasis be ILD? So atelectasis is not an interstitial lung disease. Atelectasis is when um, the, you know, the little grape sacs of the lung get smushed and they can get smushed for a variety of different reasons. And um, one of the reasons that I was explaining that the high resolution CT scan is so incredibly important is that um, atelectasis on a regular CT scan can mimic an interstitial lung disease. And one of the ways that we try and figure out whether or not the, the findings at the bases of the lungs are truly representative of interstitial lung disease is that with the HRCT protocol, we have patients go in on their stomach as well. And so we remove any component of gravity dependent atelectasis to see what lung disease truly exists in these kind of um, smushed uh, lung areas. And so those that's why the, the HRCT scan is, is incredibly important. So it's a great question. Um, next question, let's see here. Um, kind of a broad question on immunology and sarcoidosis. Where does TNF-alpha fit in sarcoidosis? Yeah, so I didn't get into the whole cytokine cocktail because that's an alphabet soup that will twist your tongue and make your head spin in a heartbeat. So we know that TNF-alpha is the way that immune cells talk to each other is through cytokines. These are small little proteins that they, you know, use to communicate with their neighbors. And there's a whole host of them. There's like 27 or there's over 30 interleukins that I know of, plus like five TNFs and the interferons. TNF alpha is one small protein that has been shown in rheumatoid arthritis and in sarcoidosis to be a major driver of that inflammatory process. And so by using TNF blockade, what you're able to do is basically stop cells from communicating with each other and kind of try to break that cycle of inflammation. And that's the way that I think about TNF. And again, I am so sorry about the construction outside of my office. Um, I know that's obnoxious. All right. Um, so the next question was wondering whether or not COVID um, is contributing to increased increases in the number of patients with interstitial lung disease. And, and I'll, um, I'll start this off and I'm going to have Dr. Wilfong, who is not only a rheumatologist, but also a pulmonologist and is caring for these patients. Um, I think we don't know the answer quite yet to COVID and interstitial lung disease and pulmonary fibrosis. Long before COVID, we've known that severe lung infection that gets you into the intensive care unit can lead to damage that we liken to pulmonary fibrosis or an interstitial lung disease. That disease tends to be, um, you know, the damage isn't done and it doesn't get worse over time. That's what I suspect is happening related to COVID is patients are getting really bad uh, lung infection and the lung has healed in a way that's led to scarring and um, that looks like interstitial lung disease. But my hope, given the number of patients who have been, um, uh, who have been getting COVID is that it is long, you know, that it is damage that's done as a result of the infection and again, does not evolve over time, but we just don't have enough time under our belts to know um, if there's something unique about COVID infection. Dr. Wolfong, do you have other um, comments related to that? I think, and I think it's hard to know because I get asked a lot, did my COVID cause my autoimmune disease? And we know that certain autoantibodies are seen with COVID, but we see that with a lot of infections actually. So even, you know, bacterial infections in the bloodstream, you can see autoantibodies in, you know, 60, 70% of patients but then it goes away in three to four months. And so I don't know that we really have the data and the understanding to know whether these are triggering long-term autoimmune disease and long-term autoantibodies, or if it's kind of nonspecific stuff that we've seen before. Um, 
and so I think as much as we want to know this answer yesterday, we're really not going to know for another three to five years, unfortunately. Yeah, that's right. Um, so the next question is one that's near and dear to my heart because that's where I started in this field is, you know, what's the relationship between interstitial lung disease and reflux disease? And this is um, a question that is still under a lot of investigation and no great answers. But what we do know is in patients who have interstitial lung disease, many of them have reflux disease. Um, so patients who have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, if you look for reflux, the majority will have reflux. And then of course, in our autoimmune patient population, in particular our scleroderma patients and also our myositis patients, reflux is a common um, comorbidity um, as a result of their underlying autoimmune condition. We don't have enough information to know chicken and egg in this particular circumstance, but uncontrolled reflux will make symptoms worse related to your interstitial lung disease, in particular related to cough. There's some suggestion even that um, there can be relationships with exacerbations, but what we do know is that if you have reflux disease that you need to have that managed as part of your um, uh, care management plan. And the oh. one I will just throw out there is I'm gonna just throw in the, the pitch for the wedge pillow. Even if you manage to get the acid levels under control, it's still not good to have non-acid stuff going in your lungs. And so if you have really bad reflux, people try to prop themselves up at night. And if you prop yourself up on two pillows, I guarantee you what happens is in the morning, you're either hunched like this or you've fallen off your little pillow fortress. So you can get wedge pillows, which are triangle things that basically put your upper body on an angle. They're about 30 bucks, they're not that bad, and it's harder to get away from it at night, and it helps keep your head above your stomach and kind of try to keep things down. So other than the medicines your doctor gives you, that's another thing that really can help reflux and help minimize, especially morning coughing. Yeah, and that's really as a mechanism of aspiration. So, um, you know, reflux predisposes you to aspiration because sometimes those stomach contents travel up the esophagus and because the esophagus and the trachea are just you know next door neighbors it's really easy for those um, stomach contents to make their way into the into the lungs particularly while patients sleep at night so that's a great point um, Dr. Wilfong, I'm going to ask you another question. Is an autoimmune cause likely if there's no history or other symptoms of an underlying autoimmune condition? Oh, this is the million dollar question, isn't it? So is it likely? Probably not. Is it possible? Potentially. And that's where I think blood work can be so important. So do I have, you know, some patients who, you know, were found on routine blood work to have an antibody that's very classically associated with lung limited autoimmune disease? Yes. But my clinic is basically a serology clinic. So everyone at Vanderbilt who comes in for ILD gets all of their serologies and then they're positive. They come and see me or one of my colleagues and we rule out probably 90% of the positive antibodies that we see. But there are a handful of people that really without antibodies and blood testing, we would probably miss clinically because there's just not much else there. Um, but typically those individuals, we actually repeat the testing to make sure that it's a persistent positive, usually at two different labs to make sure that we really believe it. Um, but, you know, there may be something subtle on your exam, but there are patients who have very subtle or absent ex what we call extra pulmonary outside the lung disease with an autoimmune cause. And I know that's probably not the answer Dr. Lee wanted to hear, but sadly it, it, it's no. the debate in our field of how, you know, do we test everybody for autoantibodies? You're gonna have a ton of false positives, which you absolutely do, um, but you can't rule it out entirely. Yes, no, I think um, serologies are tough. They're good and they're bad and sometimes, you know, make me want to pull my hair out. <laughs> so I think um, along the lines of autoantibodies, um, there's a question that's come in related to CCP antibodies in particular. And um, does that, is that indicative of an early RA diagnosis and um, how to interpret CCP antibodies? So CCP to me is one of the antibodies that I will hang my hat on if it's high titer and especially present 12 weeks apart. Um, 
we know that 10% of patients with RAILD will have ILD before their joint symptoms. We also know from Department of Defense studies that people can be CCP positive for 10 to 15 years before they clinically develop RA. What I also tell my patients is that rheumatoid arthritis is a disease that starts in the lungs. That there's more and more evidence that this is a lung-mediated, really, origin disease, and that in the lungs, you get the protein modifications, you get your CCP antibodies, and that's what drives the lung disease, and then ultimately, it leaves the lungs to go to the joints. And the joints typically present first, but it probably started in the lungs for everyone. So I tell my patients that for you to have true RA-associated ILD, you have to be CCP positive. Because rheumatoid factor we see in a lot of other diseases. Um, we see it in myositis, we see it in scleroderma, we see it in lupus, we also see it in a lot of other infections. So with a rheumatoid factor alone being evident and I, uh, positive, I usually am reticent to call that person RAILD, whereas I have a patient with a, um, ILD, especially, you know, kind of the, the scarring, what we call a UIP pattern with a CCP antibody, even in the absence of joint disease, even with normal x-rays, I would call that RAILD, and I would initiate treatment as such. Great. So the other, um, we're going to address one more question because we're just approaching um, the hour here, and I tried to kind of combine a bunch of questions into one, but um, a few people have asked, you know, whether or not um, you can have multiple forms of interstitial lung disease. Can you have a connective tissue ILD and hypersensitivity pneumonitis? Can you have IPF and hypersensitivity pneumonitis? Um, IPF is a diagnosis of exclusion, so you cannot have hypersensitivity pneumonitis or scleroderma and be given a diagnosis of IPF, so that is um, all by itself. We do see, however, hypersensitivity pneumonitis among patients who have underlying autoimmune conditions, so this is why it becomes a multidisciplinary um, approach and why we're still asking our rheumatoid arthritis patients or our scleroderma patients or sarcoid or whoever if they have a bird or if they have other occupations that might put them at risk for other types of interstitial lung disease. So yes, in terms of patients who have underlying autoimmune disorders, you can actually develop other types of interstitial lung disease, just not IPF. Anything else related to that? Dr. No, I mean, I absolutely agree. And I think the thing to realize is that sometimes you're diagnosed with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and then we figure out what's actually causing it. We find the mold under in your crawl space. We find, you know, two years later that you develop scleroderma. And so we change that diagnosis. But idiopathic means unknown. So as soon as we have another etiology for it, um, that's there. For autoimmune disease, people you know, like my mentor says, you can have teas and fle uh, fleas and ticks. So do I have some patients with true seropositive RA and myositis? Yes, I have a handful of those. Um, and then who knows which one's causing it. And I try to just pick treatments that treat both things. Um, but yeah, you, you can have more than one thing, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay, well with that, um, I'd like to thank everybody for attending our webinar. I hope you found this informative. Of course, um, this was um, presented through the collaborative work of, of many organizations and we're so appreciative of all of that. Um, there will be a brief survey that will pop up at the end of the webinar. So if you have a couple minutes, we'd love some feedback with this is something that we would like to continue moving forward. So um, thank you everybody and um, hope you have a great rest of the week.